down smack dab in the middle of summer and it is hot. It is just so hot. The days are long, it feels like 9 p.m. It's like still noon or something. It's so light outside. The schedules and the routines have relaxed and they're very fluid. The dog days of summer are upon us. Summer is my favorite time of year because summer is a time of rest, or at least it should be. In our modern times, the whole idea of summer is that kids and teachers can take a break, rest, relax, be with their families, go on vacations. Unlike the olden days when school break meant working in the fields for all the kids, which I'm sure the kids would be lo love to have that. What kid in here would love to work on their school break? Anybody? I don't see any hands. So now we use summer as a rest, as a break. In order to come back to school rejuvenated, ready, we've grown during the summer, we're ready for the next school grade. Summer is a time of rest. That is the intention, at least. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I don't feel very rested during the summer. Suddenly, these long, empty weeks that we look forward to for months fill up with vacations and road trips, grandparent visits, mission trips, vacation Bible school, swim team, day camps. The list goes on and on, and suddenly it is August, and we are racing around trying to get our school supplies because school starts in just a few days. Has anybody found yourselves there? All of a sudden, this summer that we thought we would rest, and relax is gone. We end up tired and cranky. We're ready for another vacation so we can actually rest. <laughs> for me, this summer has been different than any summer in my entire life. Some of you may know that my husband Colby and I are expecting a baby girl in December, and this is our first baby, so that means I'm about halfway through my pregnancy right now. No looking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> because of this, my idea of rest this summer has completely revolutionized. I have been forced to rest. People often ask me how I'm doing, and really the first word that comes to mind is exhausted. I feel great. I'm just exhausted. I didn't know tired until I knew pregnancy. Just, I'm sure the second one's even worse. I keep trying to blame the heat or the busy schedule or vacation Bible school or whatever it is, but in reality, the fact that I'm growing a human inside of my body is the number one reason why I'm tired. Every time we go to the doctor, she says, take naps, go to bed early, make sure your rest is really quality rest because it's the best for the baby. And I don't think I really understood this until I read somewhere that a pregnant woman lying flat on her back burns more energy than her husband does lifting weights or exercising at the gym. It's no wonder I'm tired, right? For me this summer, I've had to force myself to rest. I'm not very good at it. No matter how guilty I feel for taking that nap or leaving the list of things to do undone so I can go to bed at 9 p.m., it's imperative that I take care of myself because someone is depending on me and the rest is important. But isn't that true for all of us? Shouldn't we all take care of ourselves enough to get rest? Don't we all need to make that a priority in our lives? How tired are you? The studies are showing that the average American doesn't sleep nearly enough. We always calculate, okay, I need my eight to nine hours, but we end up exhausted anyway. Many employers, in fact, are worried about this as they begin putting nap pods in some of the really cool, trendy new companies like Google or Zappos. These pods where employees can go and nap for 10 or 15 minutes over their lunch break in the hopes to encourage productivity during the day. We need sleep. And isn't it funny how we find excuses for our exhaustion? Well, you know, I'm just tired because it's summer, but once fall comes around, I'll be better. Fall's like so much crazier, really? Or we say, I must be tired because I'm not eating right or exercising. I just need to go to bed earlier and I'll be fine. Or how about when we wear our exhaustion as a badge of honor, saying, so exhausted to everybody we come in contact with, to show maybe how busy we are or just how important we think we are. But really, there's a different reason for that deep weariness in our bones. 
When we get to that place, we must seek something different than just a few more hours of sleep. We must seek true rest. So what is true rest? What does it mean to feel rested and be rested no matter what the circumstances? What does it mean to feel rested in the busiest seasons? When you feel most burdened, what does it mean to feel rested during even those times? As you might see by now, today we are not just talking about physical rest. More important than any of this, we all need spiritual rest. So the question I should have asked you is, how tired are you spiritually? Are you feeling weary? Are you worn? Are you feeling empty? Jesus doesn't just hand us a pillow and tell us to take a nap. Instead, Jesus offers permanent rest, eternal rest, and he gives it to us freely. You might be sitting there thinking, oh great, another sermon to tell me, make me feel guilty about the fact that I don't take a Sabbath or to try to encourage me to take, you know, an hour every day in silence with Jesus. I've tried that, it doesn't work, so I'm going to tune out now. Or you might be thinking, I'm perfectly rested, I feel great, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no burdens, I'm not weary, I'm feeling awesome, I don't need to listen. Or maybe you're thinking, I am so tired, I am so weary, I am desperate for rest, tell me what I need to do, I'll sign on the dotted line, anything, just help. Wherever you find yourself today, I encourage you to open your mind and your heart to the Holy Spirit. As we walk through our passage in Matthew today, we'll not only discover the rest that Jesus offers, but also the life-changing relationship that Jesus offers because of his connection with God the Father. We'll discover that true rest has more to do with trust than it does with, to a fluffy pillow and a good night's sleep. See, trust and rest are intertwined. We cannot find rest until we trust the one who gives it. When we look at the context of our passage today we see, in which Jesus was talking, we see this metaphor about a yoke. The disciples would have understood this metaphor because they worked in the fields often. We, it might pass right over our heads. I mean, I don't work with a yoke on a daily basis. Maybe some of you do, but... The, the people that Jesus was speaking to would have had an intimate understanding of this metaphor. See, a yoke, you might already know, is a, a wooden horizontal bar that is to be placed on the necks of oxen so that they can do work in the fields. They can plow fields. They can be yoked together to push, push the plows through. They can be directed easily by the farmer or whoever's in charge. See, if the yoke was not made to fit just right, it could create an incredible burden. It could be very heavy. It could often hurt the animal. And so these, these carpenters would make the yokes that fit just perfectly to each ox. The idea of a yoke is not to make the job harder, but instead to make the job easier and to make the work lighter. Jesus, being the carpenter that he was, might have, had a, might have made a few yokes in his time here on earth. It's possible. So he uses this analogy to say that his, the yoke that he offers to us would fit us perfectly, making our burdens lighter and our journey easier. So I invite you to keep that image at the forefront of your mind as we dissect this passage into three different parts. We're going to be looking about how the passage overall really, really is about Jesus' connection to the Father. And because of Jesus' connection to the Father, we have a connection to the Father through Jesus. So the first part of the passage, the first two verses, verses 25 and 26, paint the picture of Jesus' reverence for God. Jesus acknowledges that God is the Father, Lord of heaven and earth. As we sing and we open our worship services, that's what we do. We acknowledge that God is the Father, Lord of heaven and earth giving praise to God. Jesus also shows the Father's gracious will by allowing the little children to come to him to understand these truths. See, the Father really wants us to humble ourselves in order to understand these teachings and these promises, and Jesus honors God's will in that way. 
We move to the second part of the passage um, is verse 27, and this shows Jesus' intimate relationship to God. This is the only time in, or the first time in Scripture, the first public mention that Jesus makes that God is his Father. This intimate knowing goes deeper than any other relationship that we could ever know. There's a connection here that runs so deep and impacts our relationship with Christ and our relationship with God. So the third part of the passage, the part that's most well known to us, not only because of Handel's Messiah that we've heard over and over in church, but also because this passage seems to be spoken of often. This last part of the passage shows us that Jesus rests in God's will. And then in turn, we are offered the same rest. The rest that Jesus describes is a yoke of wisdom that unites us to himself. This type of rest comes only from trusting in Christ and knowing his provision as the Savior. So with this understanding of Jesus' trust and respect to God the Father, we can understand more deeply this gift that he's offering to us in 28. Verse 28, Jesus says, come to me. I'm going to stop right there because I want you to listen to those powerful words. Jesus says, come to me. It's a simple message, but it's extraordinarily powerful. Come to me, the ultimate invitation. We all know what it's like to be invited somewhere, whether it's a birthday party or a wedding, maybe a friend calls us up and invites us to lunch, maybe it's out on a date, but we love to be invited because when we receive an invitation, we feel included and cared for, we feel known because someone wants us to be with them. They thought of us and they invited us. I mean, how many of you have dreamed that your name would be called on The Price is Right? Becky Pritchard, come on down. I want to be invited to win some money. We all want to be invited. And when we aren't invited, we feel hurt or left out or lonely because we didn't get an invite. Here in verse 28, this is the best invitation you or I will ever get. Come to me. All the gifts that Jesus gives to us begin with us coming first to him. That's the first step. Jesus invites us every single day to come to him. It's very simple. Come to me. And here's where that trust piece fits in that I was talking about a moment ago. In order to come to Jesus, we must trust that Jesus will provide the rest that we need. Coming to Jesus and sitting at his feet doesn't mean that we just find rest, but it means that we display this trust in our Savior, an unending trust. When we do come to Jesus, we must lay down our plans and our own ideas of what we think should happen next in our lives. And we trust. Now, the decision to go to Jesus is your decision. It cannot be my decision. I cannot make that decision for you. It can't be Ron Skates' decision. It cannot be the decision of First Presbyterian Church. It is your choice. And it's a personal choice that you make to come to Jesus because you know that you need him. Even if you don't know that you need him, you can still make the choice to come. Before we go to him, we have to admit that he has something that we don't. It's hard to admit that we need something. How often do we try to do it all on our own? But Jesus says, come to me. The best thing about this invitation is that you don't have to bring a gift. Like at a wedding or a birthday, you're expected to bring a gift in return for being invited to the party. There's no catch. Jesus does not expect anything from us. He doesn't expect you to do better or be better or pray more or worship harder or say less cuss words. He doesn't expect you to clean yourself up. He just says, come to me, come to me. That's all he wants. Come to me. See, Jesus is the easy path. He offers himself in replacement for the burdens that we carry. Not only rest in our lives here and now, but rest eternally. 
And don't we all want that? Don't you just go through the day sometimes and just think, oh, I just want it to be over. Not life, but just the, the exhaustion that we feel. I just want Jesus to return, to have that rest, that peace. We can't even fathom it yet. And sometimes we get this mixed up, and we go everywhere else looking for this kind of rest, this soul-quenching rest, but to the one who provides it for us. We go to the spa, or we plan luxurious vacations, or we use drugs or alcohol to induce a feeling of rest. What we don't realize is that unless we accept this invitation from Jesus, we will never truly understand rest, not the kind that is deep in our souls. Now, I'm not trying to say to you that when we trust Jesus, all of a sudden you're never going to be tired again and you're going to be good to go for the rest of your life. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is that the mental, emotional, and spiritual rest that renews our souls has to start with trusting God and his son, Jesus Christ. I find that in my own life, I'll go on a vacation, I will be physically totally rested, but I cannot seem to relax. I might have slept 12 hours a night for four nights in a row, but the things racing through my head that I refuse to let go of are keeping me from that rest. And I realize that I am holding so tightly to all the things that make me human and keep me from curling up in my Savior's lap and letting go, embracing and trusting the rest that he offers. I encourage you not to stumble over the simplicity of this invitation. Even though it seems easy to accept it, and it is easy to accept it, so many people don't. You probably know people in your own lives. You probably in your own heart have had experiences where you're like, I know what to do, I just am not ready to do it. We cannot admit that we need Jesus. We can admit that we're tired. We like to say that a lot. We all go around saying how exhausted we are, but we don't want to lay everything down in order to embrace the rest. Our pride gets in the way. We don't want to seem weak. But friends, Jesus is encouraging us, come to me. And he says, once we accept this gift personally, we are challenged to go out and invite others to enjoy this gift. How fun is it to have an invitation and to shove it in a friend's face and say, you're invited too, come with me to the party. That's what we get to do. That is what we get to do is we get to leave these walls and we get to go out into the world and invite people to come along with us. And then we get to watch the Holy Spirit transform their lives. And what an amazing gift it is to see someone find true rest for the first time. The relief, the peace, the life, and the joy. The invitation is the most important part. But what comes after the invitation reminds us of our humanness and how much we need Jesus. Jesus knows that as humans, we are weary, we are heavy burdened. But when he refers to these burdens, he doesn't refer to just the normal stresses that you and I encounter in our daily lives. Instead, in the context of Jesus' life and ministry, this burden is a state of weariness under the Jewish law. Trying to live up to the law and follow it strictly like the Pharisees was a massive burden for those who were called to follow Christ. The good news is that Jesus came to overcome the law. This is Jesus' response to the rejection, to his own rejection by the religious leadership. He offers an alternative. Jesus alone can come alongside and lift the load and cause you to rest. And there is sweet restfulness when we yoke up with Jesus Christ. Even better, that yoke it's not going to pinch. It won't bruise. It won't wear on you like the yoke that we choose to carry as humans in this world. We choose to carry the heavier yoke, but Jesus offers something so much better. But we will never attain this, this eternal rest until we come to Jesus. So yes, we need more rest. We all do. As the summer winds down and comes to a close, I encourage you to take more rest, quiet down, get more sleep, unplug, make room for family and time to relax. 
But where does this passage point directly to your life and show you where you need this Jesus kind of rest? Not just a few more hours of sleep, but a life-transforming rest. Wouldn't it be nice to wake up trusting that God has got this? That nothing can happen to you all day that God doesn't already know about? That your identity is in him alone and not in your family or your work or your money or your sickness or whatever is holding you aback? No matter what goes on in our nation or our world, that Jesus is the king of all, we can rest and trust in Jesus? This little baby that's growing inside of me has to depend on me for everything. No pressure. (laughs) Now and for many years after she's born, she has to trust that I'm going to take care of her, that Colby and I will both and do the best for her. And in the same way, you and I, we have to trust God. We have to trust and know that he will take care of us, and he already has because he sent Jesus for us. We have to trust the promise of rest that Jesus offers and come to him like little children, giving our lives over to him. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. Jesus is waiting for your response. Will you come? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we offer these words to you as an act of praise. We do acknowledge that you are the Lord of heaven and earth, and you sent your son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. And God, we pray that when we hold so tightly on to the things of this world that give us so much stress and anxiety, when we try to live up to the law and be perfect in the way that you um, have called us to be, God, we know that we are going to always fall short, but you provide the rest and hope in a way that transforms our lives. God, I pray that each person here, when they leave this room, when they leave this church building, that they might share that amazing invitation to everyone they see, just as excited as they would share a wedding announcement, a birthday party invitation, or anything else. God, we pray that that is the most important, most priority in their lives. God, we offer our praise and thanks to you for all you've given to us. In your son's name we pray, amen.